Welcome to Kuwait's Industrial Automation and Control Systems Cybersecurity Conference, KIAX Cybersecurity 2014, 25 through 26 May 2014. Hosted and organized by Equate Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC. So, our, our first session today is entitled The Threat Landscape um, to the Oil and Gas Industry. And here today to present on this subject is Don Smith, who is the Technology Director of Dell Secure Works. And with over 21 years of professional experience, Don is recognized um, in the matter of IT security, information security, and countermeasures. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage for his 30-minute presentation, Don Smith. Uh, thank you very much, folks. I'm suddenly feeling um, incredibly old. Um, so Dell and security. Oh, are the slides coming up? Yeah, you wouldn't normally think of Dell and security um, in the same sentence. But of course, Dell has been on an acquisition spree for the last few years. And I can tell you, based on some of the work that I'm doing, that what you've seen so far is the start, not the end, of what Dell is going to be doing in security. So I work for Dell Secure Works. What does Dell Secure Works do? Dell Secure Works is a managed security services provider. We manage and monitor people's networks um, and, and help them secure themselves against the threats that are out there today. In terms of scale, we're operating in 70 countries. Um, we have got uh, over 4,000 customers. And every day, on behalf of our customers, we're processing 80 billion security events. Last year, that was 20 trillion security events we processed. So we've got a lot of visibility, and we're operating at significant scale. Um, we're also operating um, with global reach. You can see where our operation centers are. And the analysts love us. In fact, one of the analysts loves us so much that their, their latest uh, quadrant has a, at the top right the very first um, global uh, magic quadrant for MSSPs from, from, from Gartner. OK, that's enough about Dell SecureWorks. So as we've heard, we're living in a world with a changing context. We've got lots of new and different, qualitatively different um, threat actors that are out there. Um, 10, 15 years ago, we had the, the rise of the graffiti artists. We had worms that were taking down infrastructure. And Eric has very capably described the issues of, of having unpatched systems that leave you vulnerable to that sort of stuff. And then it all went very, very quiet. And the criminals got involved. They wanted to, to, it not to be obvious they'd infected your machine because they're trying to steal your money. Then more recently, we've seen the rise of the hacktivists, uh, the intellectual property thieves. Um, and um, indeed, um, the spooks, so nation state actors and intelligence agencies. For oil and gas, what that pretty much means is there's a perfect storm because you have an industry that uh, generates a lot of money, um, you have an industry that occasionally upsets people, and you have an industry that, that delivers one of the fundamental needs of nation states, um, which means that there are lots of different threat actors with different motivations, different uh, trade craft, different appetites for risk that are going to be targeting um, your industry. So what do you do? You have to think about who may be your enemy. And critically, in your industry, you are going to be subject to targeted atta attacks, and your enemy is not a virus. The enemy is not a what, it's not a how, but a who and a why. What do you have that others want? Who might target your organization? Or critically, oh, who do you do business with that may be a target? Which of your suppliers may be used as a conduit to get into you? So who's interested in oil and gas? So as I alluded to, you know, we have to think about the big picture here. Energy independence for the People's Republic of China is a big, big deal. So sometimes when you hear discussion of, of attacks and intellectual property theft for organizations in the oil and gas industry, it may not be, in inverted commas, economic espionage, but one of the fundamental requirements of a nation state that they want to be energy independent. Similarly, if we look at Europe, obviously 
Russia has a very large interest in, in exporting gas, and perhaps they would like to remain in that powerful position with that position of influence and control over the rest of Western Europe. And similarly, Iran. So the Iranians are un unhappy with the sanctions that they're under, and that could also be a stimuli for electronic uh, cyber warfare and cyber attacks. And as alluded to earlier by Eric, you know, we have a number of cyber superpowers. Um, there's a lot of the Chinese out there. There's the Russians. Oh, oh, this clicker is not working very well. Um, we've got the Americans, the British, the Israelis, um, and the French, and, and there, are, there, are, there are others out there. These countries are investing significant amounts of money in vulnerability analysis and development of tradecraft, and that, as we'll see, is just creating problems for us um, in trying to protect our environments. So let's look at some threats, commodity threats. This graph that's coming up here um, is showing the top events across our customers. Now, I'm looking around the room. I believe there's a lot of engineers here. So you will understand if I tell you this is a log-log chart. So the x-axis and the y-axis are, are not going up 1, 2, 3, 4. They're going up 10, 100, 1,000. So what you can see at the top right are things that are very successful in terms of number of events across number of customers. Those are commodity threats. At the far bottom left-hand corner, very close to the, the crosshairs of the axis, are obviously targeted attacks. And we can see the usual things in there, exploit kits. Um, we can see the cut wheel Trojan, which is responsible for sending most of the financially focused spam that injects banking Trojans into people's uh, machines. And I'm going to come back to exploit kits in a minute. Hacktivists, again, a big target. Uh, oil and gas, a big target. This is a specific piece of analysis we did for um, uh, an oil and gas company that uh, had uh, a large uh, problem uh, in the Gulf of Mexico that made them uh, very, very unpopular. At that time, they were subject to uh, DDoS attacks by hacktivists, and this, piece, this particular piece of bespoke malware had been crafted um, as a result of uh, the things that went on there. What we've also seen with hacktivists, and I, I've grouped this in here because of the, the DDoS link, um, Eric mentioned earlier, um, uh, he, he, he nicely pointed the finger at Iran on this, which, uh, which helps me out a bit, um, it, about attacks against financial institutions in the United States. Uh, these have been going on for uh, two and a half years now. Uh, the size of the attacks is absolutely withering, and there is a significant concern that um, if sanctions discussions or other things go a different way, um, then uh, the, the Iranians may bring um, their guns to bear on uh, industries in the Middle East or in Western Europe. And if we look at what happened on the 28th of January, the DDoS against two of the largest banks in the United States was 180 gigabits per second. Now, what is uh, really shameful about this is how, how easy it was to do. Um, again, I, I reference Eric's discussion on vulnerabilities. There are lots of vulnerabilities in plugins for content management systems like WordPress, Drupal, and Joomla. And in this case, the bad guys are actually leveraging search engines to identify vulnerable websites, compromising them en masse, and then using that as a force multiplier in order to generate their DDoS traffic. So at any point in time, there's something between 15 and 20,000 compromised websites that are contributing to that denial of service attack. And sabotage. Okay, so we don't really need to say too much about sabotage. Um, Everybody is familiar with this one that's been discussed already, um, and this one. Although there is an interesting aspect to, to Shamoon, where uh, the, the malware didn't actually destroy machines. It made them unusable, um, but you could recover, and you could recover the data. And the analogy that's often drawn is it's the same as creating wounded soldiers in the battlefield rather than dead soldiers. A wounded soldier takes a lot more infrastructure to support than a dead soldier, and restoring the master boot record and recovering partial amounts of data from hard drives, as could be done with Shamoon, it takes a lot more resources than just accepting you've lost everything. This is Justin. Justin is, um, is one of our um, ICS experts. And I just put this slide up here. Um, this is him looking apparently happy, having uh, 
managed to bring down uh, the test uh, facility that they have in the Idaho National Laboratory. But the, the, the really interesting thing is the way he did it. The way he did it was that there was a vulnerable IP-based CCTV system which he compromised and then used that to read passwords off a lab book in the fake control center. So lots and lots of different ways that the bad guys can get into your infrastructure. Cyber espionage, okay, it impacts oil and gas like it impacts everybody else. There was a specific campaign that we called Mirage that was uncovered um, a couple of years ago. We were fortunate in that we could get a hold of the domains the bad guys, the bad guys were using. We did a technique called sinkholing where we redirected the traffic from the victims to servers that we controlled, and then we could map out where the victims were. The vast majority of victims for this particular case um, were either countries or organizations that had an interest in, um, uh, in oil and gas in the south and east uh, China Sea. Um, what was also interesting about this is that some of the other victims, the, the victims that you can see in the United States, were actually ICS manufacturers. So they were producing components of industrial control systems and they were targeted as part of the same, same campaign. So a cyber espionage campaign targeting oil and gas but also targeting ICS vendors. So how does it go, targeted attacks? It's pretty simple. You've got um, three or four key phases. You have a preparation phase where you're trying to understand what you're attacking and how you're gonna get in. You have an exploitation phase and then you, you have your lateral expansion once you're in the organization to do what you want to do, followed perhaps by a cleanup phase. One very easy way to do some reconnaissance to create and craft that targeted email is LinkedIn. And in fact, this is a real invite um, which uh, a number of us at SecureWorks got uh, from somebody who patently did not work at SecureWorks and uh, we later discovered was part of a reconnaissance campaign to, to craft some emails which would give um, some credibility to them so that we would then open an attachment or click on a link. And how does that work? So as you've seen the example in the video earlier, um, there was a spearfished email that somebody clicked on um, the other way which um, we've seen happen, um, this particularly happens in the aerospace industry, um, is where uh, the bad guy will just infect a site of interest and just wait to see who will come along and visit a site that's discussing a particular piece of aviation or something and be opportunistic about the enterprises, in fact, that they attack. What then happens is you're very often redirected to something called an exploit kit. And an exploit kit is like a mini expert system that helps identify the vulnerabilities that, that Eric was describing. So the, the exploit kit will interrogate your machine and it will say, okay, which version, which browser is Don using? Um, which version of Acrobat is he using? What version of Flash? What version of Java? And it then selects the best possible exploit to gain a foothold on your machine. The bad guy has at this point put time, effort, and money into getting you to click on a link. So he wants to maximize the probability that you will click on the, that once you've clicked on the link, he will actually gain a foothold. Um, the screenshot you see in front of you is actually the homepage of the Black Hole Exploit Kit. You can see it's PHP, if any of you understand PHP, and you can see that after the first line, there's a block of encoded text. What's going on here is that the, the, the bad guy is selling this exploit kit not for very much money. In fact, this particular exploit kit you could buy for $200 for two weeks software as a service. But he's selling it and he wants to protect his intellectual property. So he's using a legitimate PHP obfuscation technology, the INQ PHP loader, to protect and encrypt his intellectual property whilst his toolkit very, may very well be being used to steal yours. Also with exploits, we have to worry about exploit frameworks. Um, this is an example of something called Metasploit, which ostensibly security researchers like me could use to test out new vulnerabilities. The problem we have with this is what happens when a vulnerability is discovered or is announced. So this uh, is the Java vulnerability, the first one of the stream of them that came out in the summer of 2012. And what you can see here 
On the right-hand side in Russian is Ponch, the author of the Black Hole Exploit Kit, saying, I've got support for the new Java Zero Day in my product. And if you look at the two red bars on the right-hand side of the timeline at the bottom, the first bar is when the vulnerability went public, and the second bar is when it was added to the Black Hole Exploit Kit um, and the Metasploit framework. So you have got approximately 24 to 48 hours from discovery to commoditization in a toolkit that can be procured for as little as $200. What you can also see in the timeline here on the left-hand side is the, the little yellow boxes, which is us preventing that exploit from operating at uh, one of our customers. Um, and how did we do that? We did that through a reputation analysis. Um, we could see that this was bad infrastructure because it had been previously used in the nitro attacks against chemical, chemical companies, so we blocked the traffic and protected this customer. And that's the thing that needs to be reinforced. These vulnerabilities exist and are used in targeted attacks for months, if not years, prior to discovery. In fact, very often these days, um, vulnerabilities are discovered because exploitation is observed rather than a security researcher sitting in a darkened room actually identifying that the vulnerability exists. So we have this kind of life cycle where the bad guys are using these vulnerabilities and targeted attacks for, for months. Then at a point in time, you have public disclosure. Within 24 or 48 hours, the exploit frameworks and exploit kits commoditize all of that hard work from the nation state actors. And then sometime after that, we have vendor updates. And sometime after that, we have patching. And I think, Eric, you gave a figure of 34 days, was it? Was, and that was the leanest that that organization could get to. And I think that's, um, that's, that does represent a good. So we have a serious issue here in terms of the, the vulnerability life cycle. OK, once a bad guy gets on, you hear lots of talk about viruses and remote access trojans, the poison ivies of this world, and all the rest of that. I don't need to tell you about that. You can Google for that, and you can find out everything you want to know about malware. Um, what I want to talk to you about is the fact that the bad guys try and abandon malware as quickly as possible. Viruses can be spotted very easily. So what do they do? And some of these things I'm showing you are, are for an, an active incident that's impacting a very, very well-known organization um, in the UK today. So the first thing the bad guys did when they compromised, immediately when they got a command prompt, was they identified who are the domain admins in this network. The next thing they did was they went looking for the domain admins. So they were looking for the privileged users. They were looking for domain admins with accounts where the password was never reset the service accounts. And the ICS world is full of service accounts. Um, so when they discovered that they had a service account there, then they started to use their own tool set so they could swap the password in memory on a machine for that service account, masquerade as the domain admin, and do whatever they wanted inside that environment. This this organization that I mentioned, where we've seen this and is active right now, has two actor groups present. The CTG is our candidate threat group tag. The second actor group there has got another tool which I actually didn't think was possible, which is dumping plain text Active Directory passwords out of memory. And you can see actually here, they, so this is this guy's technique for, for becoming a domain admin. He's getting on a box, he's running his tool, and he is getting um, the plain text password. You can see here, Pistol Pete 28 was a password that was used um, by this particular domain administrator. This actor group, though, has something else up its sleeve. And again, apologies, this is a little technical, but I, I do want to demonstrate this. So this organization has three primary domain controllers. These are the three machines that are responsible for all authentication inside Active Directory in this organization. And what we can see here is the bad guy mapping network drives from all three domain controllers, copying a DLL onto all three domain controllers, and then using psexec to um, execute that DLL on the domain controllers. So what is it actually doing? If you look at the command line there, you can see there's a double I parameter followed by something that looks like a password hash. And indeed, it is a password hash. This DLL is doing a live in-memory patch of the core authentication routines 
on Active Directory, which means that for the entirety of the 5,000 users in that organization, irrespective of which username you give, you will always log in if you give um, what we call the Chinese password. And you will always get in. So they've patched the core authentication routines for that entire enterprise. We discovered this in January this year. Um, by all accounts, not a lot of people have seen this technique used. They've seen it on individual machines, but not an entire domain being, being, being backdoored um, in this fashion, kind of like a, a, a skeleton key. Um, the kind of scary thing of this one is that the compile stamp on um, the OLE64 DLL is 2008. I have no idea how many enterprises will have had the entirety of their Active Directory compromised with a lateral expansion technique like that. Getting data out is very, very easy. Everybody's got webmail. Google for Petraeus and have a look at how the general was exchanging emails with his girlfriend. You open up an email, you attach something, you save it as a draft, you go outside the organization, you open up the same draft email and you download the attachment. No email has ever been sent. You have used Outlook Web Access as Dropbox. It's very, very easy for the bad guys to get data out. They've also got little tools that will just spit the data out very, very easily. I suppose the main point of highlighting the horizontal expansion piece there, uh, as we call it, the, the bad guy moving laterally inside your organization rather than malware, is to emphasize that looking for these guys now is, is like looking for anomalous events. It's looking for that, that single anomalous event in the infrastructure because they know that, that malware sticks their head above the parapet. They look like the tall blade of corn. So they try and move away from using viruses as quickly as possible so they look like an ordinary user. And of course, that generates absolutely massive problems uh, for um, IT security teams. It also means that if you aren't forensically ready, you don't have the right audit logs, that your chance of tracking the bad guy down is, is close to zero. OK, um, just finishing off. Actually, I've gone quite quickly, so I've got some time back. Good. Um, a recent campaign, campaign involving industrial control systems. Now, we haven't pulled the thread on this yet to understand whether this was le being leveraged to target industrial control systems or whether this has been leveraged to target the organizations. So it involves the Havex Trojan, which is an evolution of agent.btz, which is the, um, the famous Trojan that upset the US military, um, Operation Buckshot Yankee and such like. So it's um, uh, allegedly, it's a Russian state-sponsored malware, and it seems to target uh, um, uh, primary industries, so mining and um, oil and gas. And in, in this case, what's happened is the Trojan has been embedded in the installer for legitimate industrial control systems management applications. So it looks like you've got the installer for a particular piece of software. You double click on it, the software installs, but in the background, the Trojan has in injected itself. I'm not an ICS expert, but the, the tools that have been compromised are from um, MB Connect Line and E1, and we understand that um, from discussions with various organizations that they, in fact, were, were actually compromised as a conduit to delivery of this, oops, these suppliers of ICS software were compromised to deliver these software packages through their own download sites to their customers. So the bad guys are putting a huge amount of effort into making sure they get a foothold in your organization. They're very good at what they do, they're smart at what they do, and they think out of the box to say, okay, if we compromise this organization, we compromise the core tools that all their customers download, then we get into all of those customers. Um, we tipped it, we told our customers about it, we've told various certs about it. Um, and it's easy when you, when you, particularly in this region, I think it's easy to think of the big campaigns, you know, the, the Shamoons and such like. It, it's worth being aware that these campaigns are running all of the time. So this is one from, uh, from last week 
which is uh, another spear phishing campaign uh, targeting the Japanese Ocean Oceanographic Research Institute. And again, you know, the usual stuff embedded into a Word document. Okay, so how to fix it? My next slide has, um, has the magic security solution for all of us. Um, it's got a silver bullet on it. No, it doesn't. There is no other route than having a layered approach to security. Minimize your attack surface. The, the art of OS minimization is lost. You, you, you fix your vulnerability analysis problem if you have less vulnerabilities to analyze. Um, minimize who's got ha access to what with good identity management. I appreciate that the context that needs to be applied in the ICS environment makes that an even more complex problem. But there is o the only way to approach this is to have controls at every level, overlapping controls, the onion model of security. It's just hard work. You also need to have good intelligence. You need to understand the threats that you're facing. You need to have some security superheroes who understand everything there is to know about security. You need to have strong processes. We need to have an ITIL of security. It isn't good enough just to have technology and tools. It's, it's much more about process and people than it is about tools. And that's everything from me. Thank you very much. Hosted and organized by Equate Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC.